On this episode, Engine Tech is in the garage with a killer kit. The guys are loaded with tips and tricks, and we're stoked about this striking stroker. Hey, welcome to Motorhead Garage. Oh well, boy, we got a treat for you today. You know, Sam and I are going to be doing something real special. We're going to be putting together the lower end of, a, of an engine. Actually, we're putting together a stroker motor. One of the first things you want to do is get the block nice and clean. You want to have something clean to start out with. Otherwise, it goes downhill from then on. Now, what we've done is we've gone ahead and had this honed out. This block has been all nice and clean. We've had the can bearings installed. But the final thing I like to do is, as you can see right here, take some soap and water, wash out these cylinders, make sure they're good and clean. Now I'm using just an old rag here. I'll clean these out with a lint-free rag, which is important. And once I do that, then I'll spray it down with kind of like WD-40, for instance. Spray this all down real good, let it dry, because if you don't and you just dry it off, it's going to flash rust. So this will keep that from happening. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead with this. Sam's got some other things over here. It's important to have all the right parts, and he's got them. You know, all the right parts. When you buy a stroker kit, you get a crank and rods. If you're building a motor, even if it's a stock motor, you gotta search all around. Here's a great way to go. Engine Tech has a master kit, and we've got Joe Munoz here. Joe, tell us about your kit. Everything's in one box. Yes, uh, Sam, everything's in the kit that you may need to rebuild the engine for the typical small block Chevrolet, small block Fords. We do the big block Fords, big block Chevrolets as well. It's a complete kit that allows the weekend warrior type racer to build a small block Chevrolet, for example, up into the 325, 350 horse range without spending a lot of money. The main advantages of our kit is that all the components in it are all matched to each other. They're all uh, insured to work with each other. You get a choice of six camshafts, for example, on the small block kit that all are guaranteed to work with the compression ratio that the pistons put out. Uh, the rings are matched to the pistons. It's just a complete kit and an easy way of getting uh, through the whole rebuilding process. Would you get a kit from Engine Tech? Get a high volume oil pump, <clears throat> you get a three piece double row time and chain set, coated hyper eutectic pistons, and of course you get a choice of six cams, you get rings, you get everything you need, cam bearings, the whole thing. Matter of fact, you also offer performance crankshafts and rods as an option. Yes sir, they're not part of the kit, but what we do is we have SCAD and some other suppliers for the tailoring and to the customer's taste of different cranks and rods they can add on to the kit if they're wanting to change out the lower. And a lot of our customers are gonna reuse their old factory crank and rods. This is another uh, addition we have to the kit if they want so. Now you supply these cam bearings in the kit. What's special about these? These cam bearings are, we've considered the finest full circle cam bearing in the industry. They are, uh, have all the leading edge chamfers uh, consistent throughout the kit so for aiding in the ease of installation. Uh, it's made of a superior battery material to avoid pound out and embeddability properties are better than most, as well as having polymer coated for ease on startup and wearable characteristics. That's great. Well, we got a long way to go. We got a lot of great stuff here. We're going to end up with a 40 over 383 stroker motor. Let's see what Davey's up to. Okay, now we got the block all cleaned up. And what I've done, I've taken this cam lube. And I've got all the cam bearings lubed. Next step now is for Sam. You got that cam ready, buddy? All set to go. Now, what I've got on the end of this cam, this is a little tool. It's inexpensive. You can buy them at most performance shops. Three bolts. That gives you leverage. Keep the cam from nicking the cam bearings. That'll save you a cam bearing. Also, if you look at all the lobes, I've applied this paste. This is cam shield. This is a enriched with zinc paste that stays on. It's what you need to do on the lobes on a flat tappet cam so you can break it in properly. Journals are clean. Dave's got the lube there. And you just take your time and insert it. Make sure that you don't nick the cam bearings. This handle really gives you a lot of leverage. How am I doing yeah, that? Yeah, you're doing good and you got to take your time doing that. So, okay, while well, Sam is going ahead and sliding that in, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we got a lot more coming, so stay with us. All right, you're doing good, man. That handle makes a difference, doesn't it? It makes a big difference. This edition of Motorhead Garage, presented by ARP, is being brought to you by ARP, the world leader in fastener technology. Original Parts Group, the world's largest source for GMA body parts and accessories. AMS, because we care. 
and by Flowmaster, the exhaust technology company. Welcome back to Motorhead Garage. We're still here in the garage having fun putting our 383 stroker motor together. Now the first thing I've done is I put all the main bearing inserts in and I put it in the rear seal. Hey Joe, take a look. Am I getting this in right? Oh yeah. It's yep. in the right position. All right, now what you've got is a rear main bearing crankshaft oil seal. Part of it goes in the block and it's two-piece seal. But you know, you have a problem and that is the crankshaft that run a while to get a groove on it. You can't sleeve a two-piece rear main uh, crank because it's got a flange on it, so you'd have to have it spray welded and ground, very expensive. You come up with a great seal. Tell us about this. Yeah, that's our two-piece double lip Viton seal designed for small block Chevrolets. And what it allows the, the seal to do is ride on a different part of the crank surface. It's inward about 70 thousandths from where the original position is. So if there's a groove in the seal, this will ride on a fresh part of the uh, crank surface and it won't be down in the groove and weeping oil past it as most uh, standard position seals wind up doing. That's really a simple but great fix. So, and in the seal, by the way, is going to have some crush like a baron, so you don't need to put anything on it when you assemble this to, you know, to seal it. This will seal against itself. Now, main barons are in, by the way, these are really good looking barons. Now, this is something that you have made to your spec? Yes, this is uh, the Engine Tech main bearing set. It's a high uh, silicone content aluminum alloy. You know, most of the uh, aftermarket now has gone away from the traditional tri-metal bearing because the quality of the oil has improved so much yep. that the need for the embellibility characteristic of the tri-metal bearing has gone away. The aluminum, because of the high silicone content, allows a lot greater pound out load carrying capacity and it's less, uh, it's more corrosion resistant than the tri-metal bearing. So it's, even though the tri-metal is still good for a lot of the heavy duty applications, we now recommend it for all automotive and light duty truck applications. Well, cool. Nothing, have, nothing like having really good bearings, but you have to check the bearing oil clearance. I'm going to put the main caps on with all the bearings in it, torque them down to spec, and then I'll measure them. Dave's measuring the crankshaft. You know, one of the things that you want to do before you put an engine together and you get a new crankshaft like we have here, or even if you got an old one, you want to check the clearances. And the way you do that, and the way I like to do it, is a micrometer. Now, some guys will use a caliper. I prefer a micrometer like this. And you need to learn, to read, learn how to read it. Before you start, though, you want to make sure that your mic is accurate. And they all come with a little gauge like this in order to test it to make sure that you are you have your mic accurate. If it's not, then you can adjust it so that it is accurate. And this one is pretty much right on the money. So we know that our measure is going to be good. Now, what I do is I'll take it, and I'm going down here to the front. This is the main bearing. You got the main bearing uh, raises right here, 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 and here. And of course, the, on here on the crank, this is where the rod bearings go. And you want to measure them all. So what I'll do is I'll measure it. Take bring this up a little bit and then you just get it so it just touches you just got a little bit of drag on it and this will come with a little bit of practice once you get the reading then I like to write it down and keep track of it once I have them all down then I can go and compare that with what Sam is doing but this is how you get your clearances on here or make sure you have them and I always like to keep that because it keeps a record of what you're doing anyway this is almost all done We'll let Sam finish up what he's doing. We're going to compare the two. All right, buddy. I've got these all written down here, and uh, that's looking got? pretty consistent. Okay, let me take a look at it You here. do the math. Yeah, you give Good me the hard job all the time. How I measured the bearings. We got all the bearings installed, and the main caps torque to spec. Of course, everything's nice and dry. This is a snap gauge. You put it in here, and you move it around. Then you lock it. It's spring-loaded. You lock it down, take it out, take your micrometers, Get in here, measure it, and it gives you the accurate reading of the dimension of the inside of this bearing. Compare that to what you had in the crank where we okay. stand for clearance. All right, so what I've done here is I've compared yours to mine. What I got is uh, a large, about three thousandths, and about 2.2, 2, you know, 2 and 2 tenths is what it is. So right we're well in spec. spec. Absolutely. Need to do that's real important. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to show you a great way to check your clearance without the use of mics and the snap gauge. Also, show you how to set up crankshaft and thrust. Stick around, we got a lot to do. Motorhead Garage, presented by ARP, coming to you from Borla Commerce Park.
Welcome back to Motorhead Garage. We're continuing on with our 383 stroker. Now what I did was I put some plastic gauge on the journal, I'll show you that in a minute, put the rod cap on and then I torqued it properly. Now we have these nice ARP studs. You get flat washers and flange nuts with the studs. Put the washer on dry. You take your ARP ultra torque assembly lube. You put some on the face of the nut, on the top of the washer and on the threads. So when you tighten it up, it becomes a bearing surface and you get accurate torque. When I pull the cap off, now I've torqued it down to 80 pounds of spec, and you can see here the plastic gauge has squeezed out. Now this is what plastic gauge looks like. It's a very fine little thread. It's inexpensive, you can buy it anywhere. Put it across the bearing, you torque it down, it squeezes it out. Then there's graduations right here. They're metric an inch, depending on which side you look at. And you compare that to the envelope right there. Got a shade over 2,000 oil clearance right where we want to be. It's a great way, inexpensive way, but make sure you do something to check your oil clearance on all your bearings. If you don't have a mic and snap gauge, plastic gauge will get you by. I'm going to set up now with a dial indicator to check the crankshaft end float. While I'm setting up, let's take a look and see how Dave's doing with the pistons. All right, what I've done here now is I've taken all the rods and the pistons out. I've taken the rods. You can see these are from SCAT, and boy, they are nice rods. What you got to do is you want to make sure you break the rod bolts loose first. That way, you can separate these things. So you have to do that, of course, put in the bearings. The other thing I've done is got the pistons out, and I've oriented. I've gone ahead and started to check this thing out to make sure that I have, get the rod and the piston assembled in the proper way. Now, there is a certain orientation to that, and a lot of times, pistons are marked with a little notch on it to let you know that this goes to the front end of the block. What you want to do is you want to put a little bit of oil on your rod, your piston, and your pin. Pre-assemble everything. See how it's all going to fit. You want to measure, make sure everything's going to be fine. In this particular case, looks like we're in pretty good shape. And I put one uh, retainer in here just to hold it. But I've gone through all of this just to check everything. I've left one piston here, of course, undone. And the reason for that is because we're going to use this as a way of checking our piston rings, squaring them up in our block. And before I go too much farther, we got to get all the piston rings checked, measured, so that I can assemble them on here. All right, now we're going to check crankshaft end float, which is the amount the crankshaft moved back and forth. What you have is it's controlled by the flange bearing or the thrust bearing. In this particular engine, it's in the number five main, sometimes it's in the center main. It's a bearing that's flanged over, and of course you've got to have some clearance or it'll burn up. So what I do is set up a magnetic indicator, a dial indicator on a magnetic base, move the crank in one direction, zero the meter, and then I'll move the crank back, make sure we're zeroed. And if you look at that, we've got almost three thousandths crankshaft end float. That's good, you don't want too much, you don't want too little. If it's too tight, you'll burn the uh, flange bearings out. So that's all the, you know, up to the crank grinder. It's got to be ground if it's too loose. Again, sometimes you can get try a different bearing that has a little thicker flange on it. Most of the time, the crank is going back to the grinder to be fixed. So with that all set, the crank turns freely, and that's the important thing. Even though you've checked everything, make sure the crank will turn freely. Everything's torqued tight and it turns like glass. That's the way it should be. Hey Dave, we're about ready to bring your pistons over here, buddy. See if we can set this up. Okay, partner. Got everything just about done here for you. That's great. Looks good. Get this up here. Here's your ringer and here's your pistoni. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate okay. it. All right. Now, what I've done here, folks, is I've got everything together. What I did do is I left one piston off the rod. And I want to show you this hoop, by the way. What we have here is what we call a floating pin or floating piston. What happens in most cases, or a lot of cases, the pin is pressed into the rod. It just stays put. In this case, it floats. Less friction works great for performance work. Now, the one thing you want to do is get your piston rings out. And by the way, when you get your box like this, be careful when you open it up. You want to look because it'll say top groove, second groove. You don't want to get those mixed up. Take out your ring. And you want to go and start measuring the clearance between the ring and the groove. This is important because if they're too tight, you're going to be in trouble. You want about a thou and a half clearance. So I got a feeler gauge here for that. And it's exactly what I got. You just got a nice little drag on that. You want to take all those rings. You got to do that with all your pistons so it takes some time. But it's well worth it. Meanwhile, Sam is going and taking these rings and measuring them for the bore. 
you know, this is the most important thing is measuring things in an engine. And like before you send it out for balance, like your crankshaft and rods and all that stuff, fit everything, fit it dry, make sure it's gonna work. Because if you send it out and the balance guy grinds on it or wells on it, then you can't send it back if it doesn't fit. These rings are real high quality. They're chrome molly rings. The engine tech kit's got all high quality stuff in it. And these are hyper detected pistons, coated skirts. Dave left me a piston loose because I'm using that to push the ring down square in the bore. Once it's square, I can look at the ring gap, which is right there. That's a critical measurement. You want to have about 16 thousandths, 14 to 16 thousandths on this engine. I got a 15 thousandths feeler gauge, middle of the spec, and that's perfect. It's right on the money. And that tells me the bore job is good and the ring set is terrific. You did good, but what happens if it's too tight? We've got a fix for that and that is this ring cutter right here. This is one of the types that they look like. Put it in there, you can grind the edges of the ring down and then get it to the right gap that you want. But if it's too big, we can't shrink it. That's right, you just need to get a different set of rings. Now, we need to take a quick break. We've got a lot more coming on our 383 stroker break. We come back, gonna show you a really trick timing components that come in the engine tech kit with a three keyway crankshaft sprocket. Let's get these things all together and in there. All right. This may be a first on the Steel Spotlight, a car that's actually my fault in some way, shape, or form, correct? Correct, that is correct. We uh, actually met at the SEMA show last year. You invited us to get a car done for your show. This is the wife's car. We uh, <laughs> found this for her about three years ago. It's something she's wanted since we've met. She's always wanted a four-door Bel Air. Funny thing is, we live in Wisconsin, managed to find one, all of it was there in Wisconsin. And you kept it very original. I love that you kept the six cylinder in here too. Oh yeah, that was uh, a big fight between uh, the rest of the family. I've got a lot of big motorheads in the family and it was kind of a bet to see if we could make a six move. You guys had to learn some skills just to get this oh, thing exactly. done, didn't you? Oh yes, uh, the wife actually, the interior that's done on the car, this was her first run at doing actual car interior and there was no seats in it. It was a metal frame so there was no pattern. We just had to make up the foam, what goes where, that whole thing. If I'm at fault for this, I'm not going to apologize for that, but you're in trouble for what I request next. This edition of Motorhead Garage, presented by ARP, is being brought to you by Molly, driven by performance. Green Ball Tires, tires for the road for work and play. Rock Smasher, never kneel to a tire again. And by Bruce High Performance Transport, leading the industry since 1981. Hey, welcome back to Motorhead Garage. Well, you can see we got our short block pretty much together. The only thing left to do now is to time the cam. And Sam, you know, there's a little story here about that uh, crank sprocket in there. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of guys call these crank gears, it's a sprocket because it drives a chain. Now this is a really nice, high performance, double roller chain with the two sprockets, they're all steel, comes in the engine tech kit. Here's a unique, unique thing. This is a crankshaft sprocket it has three keyways. When your number one piston's at top dead center on a Chevrolet, the keyway's about two o'clock, this dot's gonna line up. Put that, these two lined up, pretty much times you can. For you know, a street machine, a taxi cab, it's gonna be fine. Doing a performance motor, you wanna dial your cam in, you may need to retard or advance it a few degrees. So if you look at this, it's three keyways. This keyway, if you set it there, you're four degrees advance on the cam. Set it on that keyway, you're four degrees retard and that does a really nice job. Now, there's a reason why you may want to advance or retard your cam, depending on how you drive your car, what this thing is going in. If you want to get a lot of low end, low end torque, you'll want to advance your cam. If you went high end torque, you want to retard the cam a little right. bit. So that's something to keep in mind, but whatever you do, be sure you follow what he's going to show you right now. And you want to check it, and of course, it's dialing in your cam, follow your cam card, see where they want it set up. Now, there's a nice radius machined onto this sprocket and it matches the radius on the snout of this nice uh, scat crank. We don't want to damage anything. I see a lot of guys put these on, find the keyway, and even a brass punch. They take and they drive it on. You don't want to do that. You can set up stress risers. This is a harmonic balancer installing tool. You're going to need that to put your balancer on. And there's a sleeve. This goes on here. You put this in and 
You get the arbor screwed into the end of the crankshaft, which is a 7 16 20. Then you take this as a bearing here, and you work it, you push it on until it bottoms out. It's nice, and you don't damage it. Did I ever tell you how good a job you do on those things? Yeah, I do a great job, I know. <laughs> no, you don't tell me enough. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, there you go, folks. You can see what it takes to put this together. There's a lot more to it, of course, but we tried to give you some real highlights and some things to look at and things to do if you try to do this on your own. Once again, we've run out of time. We'll see you again next time here at Motorhead Garage. So long. Why don't you go get us some coffee? Coffee? I'll finish this up. You can this get a coffee. It's done my growth. You kidding <laughs> yeah, me? Yeah, I can tell it has.